Sunday. So the story we have, the gospel message we have from Matthew, is that well-known one about the Magi. Let us hear what Matthew writes. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who was born to be king of the Jews? For we have observed his star as rising, and have come to pay him homage. Well, when King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, Herod inquired of them, But where is it the Messiah is to be born? And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet Micah. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I also may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, the wise men set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, that, when they had saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Please be seated. So, who are these wise men. And what were they doing? We have this story written by Matthew. And we know this story was written long after the birth of Jesus. Even long after the death of Jesus. And we don't see it this way in the other Gospels. Luke has a birth story. But neither John nor Mark mention it at all. So we have this story of a manger and wise men that Matthew has put together of the story of the birth of this Messiah that he has found and worships. Matthew is writing to the Jews. And he's writing to the Jews at a time when the Jews weren't so much caught up in Jesus. The Gentiles the Gentiles, the non-Jews, they believed in Jesus. They believed that he was the Messiah, that he had come to change the world. <clears throat> the Jews, kind of like the, the scribes in this passage, weren't so much hip on the idea that this was the Messiah. And so Matthew's story is in that context. And so he uses this to kind of explain how the Gentiles got the news and why the Jews aren't quite there. So who were these wise men? They were wise men. That much we know. That's what Matthew tells us. That wise folk saw something. Well, the word that he uses, the Magi, those are men who would have studied they would have studied all the books, and they weren't books, they were scrolls, all the writings they could from all the cultures that they could gather. They were obviously folk who were seeking something. Seeking something more than they had, more intellectually, more spiritual. They were seeking something. And they read scripture and scroll after scroll. And they amassed that knowledge. So the wise folk that follow the star and find Jesus were, first of all, folk that study. They 
were seeking. And then, they didn't just look at books like some of us intellectuals and scholars. They did more than just study the books. They studied the world. Magi, part of that word, they assumed were astrologers. So they not just looked at the books. They looked at the world and were observant of what was going on in the world around them. So they were seers as well. And because they were seekers and seers, because they were open to whatever would come to them, there was a moment when they saw something that said, you know what? That reminds me of something that was written here. And so they took what they observed and what they knew, and there was this confluence of knowledge and experience and observation. And they said, hmm, something new is happening. And we want to find out more about it. And so these wise folk who are seeking the light, seeking something different, go to find verification, confirmation. They're not so arrogant that they know everything, that they go, I think this is this scroll from the Jews that talks about this. Let's go investigate. And so they go. And they go, where else are they going to go? To the head, to the country, to the, to the king, and say, okay, We've seen this happening, and we think it means something. Do you know anything about there being a king born? Now, why? I think this casts a little bit of aspersions on their wisdom because why you would go to a king, a powerful being, not I mean a king who already has murdered people, and say to him, "We think there's a new one born. He's going to take your place." Do you know anything about that? Sure, sure, and I would honor. calls the scholars that he has and says to them, where, you know, do you know about where it says there's going to be, the king will be born? And I mean, these guys are guys that not only know the scrolls, they're the ones that wrote them down, so they know it by heart. So yeah, Micah, what was it, 2? Micah 6. Micah 2. And it says he's going to be born in Bethlehem. That's where it's going to happen. Because Micah says he's going to spring up and they will shepherd our people, so that's got to be it. And King says, okay, and they say, fine. You know, you think if they were the scribes and priests to have someone say, we think this is fulfilled, they would go, oh boy, let's go with you. But they say, that's the information. We're going back to the cozy room we have back here with the temple. So Herod then gives these seekers, these seers, these non-arrogant strangers the information. Let's go to be in Bethlehem. So go, but I really want to worship him too, so let me know, you know, when you get there if you find anything. And so they go on with the information that they have. They've asked directions so they know where they're going. Which makes me think there must have been some women there because if they were just men, they would not have <laughs> There had to have been some women saying, okay guys, we've been following you all this way. Let's, let's get some really firm directions here. <laughs> but maybe they really were wise men and they knew enough to ask. So they had directions. And they got there. And just like the shepherds, when they found that baby, something in them shifted. And they knew this was a special child, a special light. Something different had come into the world. And they knelt down and gave the best that they had. Now later, Christian authors have added the, you know, it's the myrrh and frankincense and, and have tried to make it all kind of symbolic. But the bottom line is, they gave the best that they had, and as much as they had, to this family. 
I mean, what did they see that would make them want to do that? I mean, the shepherds, they saw a baby in a stable, yet they bowed down and worshiped. These guys found a, an economically limited family, uh, probably two or three year old, and we've seen the two or three year olds that we've had around here, dancing and playing Legos. A teenage mother, and yet something about this light made them know that this was the promise that would change the world. Change the world. And then we know that they didn't just end when they found the light. They didn't build a mansion and say, we're just going to stay and kind of watch this child so we can be in his presence and, you know, get, you know, benefit from his whatever. They were still open to the next new that this child would bring. They didn't shut down. They were open enough to feel the leading of the Spirit which said, you know, don't go back and tell that king here and where this baby is because we don't think anything good will come of that. So they knew that the end of their journey was not an end, but another beginning. Matthew tells us a story that has people who are wise studying scripture, studying the world, being aware of what the world was offering, what the world wasn't offering, responding to that confluence when they were led to, checking along with those who might know along the way, or have this ride or following the wrong way, and then finding So these 
are the resolutions I would propose you think about. Number one, I will live in the present moment. I will not obsess about the past or worry about the future. Two, I will cultivate the art of making connections. I will pay attention to how my life is intimately related to all life on the planet. I will be thankful for all the blessings in my life. I will spell out my days with a grammar of gratitude. I like that one. I will practice hospitality in a world where too often strangers are feared, enemies are hated, and the other is shunned. I will welcome guests and alien ideas with graciousness. I will seek liberty and justice for all. I will work for a free and just world. I will add to the planet's fund of goodwill by practicing little acts of kindness, brief words of encouragement, and manifold expressions of courtesy. I will cultivate the skill of deep listening. I will remember that all things in the world want to be heard, even the many voices inside my head. I will practice reverence for life by seeing the sacred in with and under all things. I will give up trying to hide, deny, or escape from my imperfections. I will listen to what my shadow side has to say to me. And finally, I will be willing to learn from the spiritual teachers all around me however unlikely or unlike me they may be. How are we going to leave this place? If nothing else, I challenge you just to take a different street home from church today. Let us be in prayer and ask God to show us how we might